In the year 2000, as a social entrepreneur, I began to think about bridging the mental health gap. I learned that some 450 million people suffer from mental illness at any one time. I asked myself, where were the headlines? Where was the sense of emergency that so often is associated with a medical crisis? After some time, I decided that the world was going to let this crisis by. They were going to ignore it. Coming right up to date, The Lancet has just published a new commission. And the commission uh, reports as follows. There are something like 21 million people living with schizophrenia at the present time. 300 million people living with depression. And every 40 seconds, someone, somewhere, commits suicide. The gentleman in the screen is Francis. And he, a few years ago, had a major mental health trauma. After some time, his family decided that they would incarcerate him in a small room where they lived. They pinioned his legs into a tree trunk, a bit like an old-fashioned pair of stocks. And there he languished for two years. Finally, a team came to his rescue. And with careful and thoughtful concern, they negotiated his release into treatment. Of course, we can think about mental illness in terms of numbers, but we can also think about it in a different way. We can think about it in terms of finance. So, for example, how much money is spent on the financing of mental illness in developing countries? Well, it's 1% of health budget. 1% of health budget. Is it any wonder, with such small amounts of money going into the health budget, is it any wonder that people like Francis have a terrible time just for being mentally ill. I feel that um, an injustice of this kind needs a solution. And the solution that I came up with in the year 2000 was the model for mental health and development. The point is that if you fight injustice, you have to be able to, first of all, overcome a sense of an intolerable mountain to climb. And you have to be able to divide the problem down, as a social entrepreneur, into manageable portions, enabling, in this case, mentally ill people, in a sense, to bridge out to those without mental illness so as to be able to resolve the problem. The model is practical, and it starts with consultation and capacity building. When you organize a capacity building meeting, of course, you need to make sure that the local people understand what's happening, and particularly the traditional authorities. They need to understand uh, what is going to happen, particularly because of the taboo associated with mental illness. It takes time and patience to be able to assemble the right people to organize such an event. But in the end, the event occurs. And people come from three days' walk away. Some people 
actually swim across a major river to get to the event. There's a sense of excitement, exuberance. People have a little dance. And the consultation begins. The mentally ill people are divided out into one group, the family members into another group, and finally, but not least, the professionals who are going to be part of the program into a third group. And they discuss the topic guide, My World, what it's like to be a mentally ill person in this place at this time. In due course, the information is gathered together. And you can imagine there are stories. There are stories of hope. But there are also stories of rejection. There are stories of cruelty and of people walking on the other side. Friends that I knew once went over to the other side. Stories of exclusion. All of this is put into a manageable form and is then reported back to the larger community. Everybody assembles, and people who have not been part of the morning program then come together to listen to this part. And you get that sense, that palpable sense of exclusion being communicated to people in such a way that for the very first time, like a pin dropping on the earth, you can hear what it is, and you can feel what it is to be mentally ill in this community at this time. And you feel that longing, that longing to be included. And so you begin to understand. As the day comes to an end, the consultation meeting is ending. So what happens is that people don't want to lose this sense of being together, of this sense of being able to work together. And so they make a decision, a number of decisions, about how they're going to work together in the future. And this is, of course, a very beautiful moment in the, in the context of a consultation of this kind. One of the most important decisions is that they decide they're going to create a self-help group. And self-help, as you can imagine, is a really important part of this. But what of treatment? We've already seen through the question of financing that resources are very scarce. And this is, of course, particularly so in the context of treatment. Uh, we've, we can see that um, if you look at a country like uh, Laos, for example, Two psychiatrists for the whole country. Look at a country like Ghana, 18 psychiatrists for the whole country. These resources are very scarce. And it's equally true of well-trained nurses. And so what you need to have here is this phrase which has come into the language now, this question of task shifting. So instead of uh, the psychiatrists or the nurses or the doctors organizing. That's passed down then to community health workers and particularly volunteer village health workers. And they now play that important part, task shifting, of being able to signpost the uh, way to treatment, of being able to recognize the onset of mental illness and indeed helping the family understand what mental illness is. But if you live in a very low resource country, it's most likely that the first person you will go and see is the traditional healer. Traditional healers, of course, can be kind and they can be cruel, they can be empathic and otherwise. But what's really important is to understand that there is a way in which a traditional healer can talk to a patient which is culturally appropriate. It's in context. And that conversation is a really important conversation for the patient to have. In an ideal world, uh, the healer community and the medical authorities should have a relationship, and they should refer to each other 
and respect each other. And when that happens, uh, patients feel uh, appreciated and the choices they make seem to be respected. As people come into recovery, so they yearn to be able to make a contribution back to their family, economic and social contribution back to their family. And I think the livelihoods aspect of this model is very important, therefore, from that point of view. Uh, of course, people want to earn and give back to family, but they also want to be able to do it in a way which feels appropriate. So in an area where farming takes place, it's best, it seems to me, to encourage those people coming through the recovery process to go into farming. If it's pottery, then why not encourage the people to go into pottery? And so, in that sense, what you get is a, not only the economic benefits, but you also get the sense of integration, which is really important. Integration into the community is not something which is simple. And if you work at the same things that other people work at, so people look at you and they say, he's trying to come back to join us, and we admire that. And stigma then begins to melt gently away, it takes time. So what is it that I've learned in this development of the model for mental health and development? What have I learned and what can I share with you? Well, first of all, consultation itself really works. It seems to me that it's really important, and guess what? Talking helps. It really helps to be able to talk through and organize, to be able to create self-help groups, it seems to me, is a very important feature of the model. And people enjoy it. I've also learned this matter of uh, cultural, the cultural acceptance or understanding of mental illness. Don't get me wrong. I think people suffer enormously through this collection of illnesses, mental illness. They suffer terribly. But the suffering may be the same, but the interpretation of it can be different country to country, society to society. And it's only when we understand that and work with that as part of our norm that we are going to really be able to have an impact on this. As the curtain has come back on certain communities that I've worked in, I've understood a little bit, at least, about stigma, how families reject the patient as they become ill, how, how they get rejected by their friends. They sort of roll in a ripple out onto the outskirts, the margin of the society in which they live. Maybe they end up living in the street. And then as the treatment comes about and begins to become effective, so then people begin to take cognizance once again of this individual. In a sense, there's a reverse ripple. And in an ideal world, the patient then comes back into the bosom of their family. I have a feeling that what we understand by community mental health in developing countries has something to teach us here in our own country. Maybe it's about that patients really appreciate the economic and social aspects of treatment as much as they might treat, um, appreciate the medical aspect. I want to thank two organizations, Basic Needs and CBM UK, who are taking this model forward. It's a great comfort to me uh, to know that this model is going to be taken forward and developed further as we go forward in time. Do you remember Francis? His original uh, profession was that of teacher.
And after some time, the education authority came into an agreement with Francis to go back into his school and to teach the young children there. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, like you and like me, he found love. Thank you.